Welcome back. You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. Well, 11 years ago on Tuesday, 19 terrorists hijacked passenger jets and coordinated strikes into the World Trade Center in New York, the Pentagon, and intended to fly the fourth hijacked jet into the capital. The United States and the world community responded by what the then US President George Bush dubbed the War on Terror. This led to the invasion of Afghanistan to depose the Taliban, which had harbored al-Qaeda, who were behind the attacks. But it wasn't until May 2011 that al-Qaeda's leader, Osama bin Laden, was located and killed. But more than a decade on, troops are still in Afghanistan. Bin Laden may be dead, but the conflict has morphed into something else, with no easing of militant activity among Islamists with Africa now possibly the new front for al-Qaeda. So 11 years on, what is the legacy of 9-11? To discuss this, I'm joined by Dr. Ali Brahimi. She's a research fellow at the London School of Economics. Professor Roger Griffin, he's a professor of modern history at Oxford Brookes University, and his book Terrorists' Creed examines fanatical violence. It's out next month. And Dr. Tobias Feekin, director of the National Security and Resilience Department of the Royal United Services Institute. And on the line from Nairobi is James Rinal. He's a Middle East and East Africa correspondent. Tobias Feekin, 11 years on from 9-11, what do you think is the most significant uh, legacy of those attacks? I think the most significant legacy is the fact that, that those attacks preempted a decade of um, security situations which were led by terrorism. And, and, and really, I don't think the world had seen anything like that uh, in previous history. Not the fact that such a small group of individuals could, could shape world politics and world events in such a radical way. Um, you know, we've just come through a relatively stable period of time, the Cold War. I mean, you can argue that one um, if you like to be blue in the face. But but in comparison to the decade that we've just been through, the number of interventions um, and, and if you like, the, the severity of the response to that attack uh, by the West um, was hugely significant. And, and still now, I think governments are beginning to try and assess, OK, what does the next decade have for us? It, are we going to continue to respond to these kind of events in the way that we have? And I think that's probably, you know, the biggest le- legacy. For- um, Ali Ibrahimi from LSC. Afghanistan was clearly the focal point of any kind of retribution. In retrospect, was this the correct move? I think that, um, you know, an intervention in Afghanistan was perhaps more um, justifiable in many ways, both strategically, morally, politically, than what happened in Iraq. But I think that the intervention itself, the way that it was shaped, the way it panned out, as did the one in Iraq, was based on this kind of war paradigm approach to the problem. And uh, whereas maybe a more law enforcement uh, approach would have been more appropriate, given the fact that, as Tobias mentioned, this was a small group of people with a a relatively fringe uh, ideology. And so I think that in many ways we painted ourselves into that corner and we're just trying to find little chinks to get out of it. And a lot of that was shaped by uh, the paradigms that we used, uh, that we, we used intellectually, and that uh, haven't entirely been dislodged in Washington and in London. Um, indeed, two days ago, Barack Obama made uh, made a statement ahead of the 9/11 anniversary. We took the fight to Al Qaeda, decimating their leadership, and put them on the path to defeat. And thanks to the courage and skill of our intelligence personnel and armed forces, Osama bin Laden will never threaten America again. Instead of pulling back from the world, we've strengthened our alliances while improving our security here at home. Roger Griffin from Oxford University. Is he right to say that um, they've taken the fight to al-Qaeda and put them on the path to defeat? Well, uh, I think that sort of pronouncement perpetuates the idea that al-Qaeda occupies the same sort of political role in history as, say, Stalin or Hitler. It's an ad hominem argument that there is this single force out there that you can defeat Um, And, of course, what is very clear beyond the clichés of journalists uh, feeding into a neocon um, agenda is the fact that al-Qaeda is, as a fighting force, may even be on the decline. But what what is threatening Western hegemony is is a mindset which is actually, in terms of people who represent it, very small, but it is a, there is a, an Islamist worldview which can take various organizational forms and can be adapted to all sorts of different particular national and political situations, but it is a mindset which is at war with Western values, and you can't defeat it by taking out the leader of one particular strand of it. And in a way, Obama and I'm sure he's far too intelligent to actually believe what he says, in a way he's keying into 
the Bush fallacy that there is a war on terrorism and you can locate where it is and bomb it to pieces or kill its leaders. So I find that sort of rhetoric very sad, really, because it shows how, in terms of official discourse, so little has been learnt in the way we understand what Islamism is. Obama did reference uh, the death of, of bin Laden um, during his speech last week, and I guess um, all eyes are turned towards the end of 2014 with the drawdown of troops in Afghanistan. But do we expect um, the uh, a return the Afghan jihad to begin in earnest after then? It's a, an incredibly fragmented picture, I think. In in the wake of 2014, you will see um, an Afghanistan which. Um, is entirely more fragmented than it was before, before we went in in 2001. That's not to say that it would leave itself open to the kind of whole-scale terrorist safe haven that it perhaps was. Um, At that point, you had a Taliban who were very much in control of the country. Now, that's not quite the case now. You still have international forces there. We don't know if the Taliban will take complete control of that country post-2014 drawdown. There's a huge number of other actors who are who are playing in, in, in that country. And perhaps one of the problems we have is that there's very little public of understand, understanding of how complex that country is, how complex the history is. Once you begin to understand that, perhaps you can begin to understand what that picture might look like. I think, you know, there have been various elements of analysis that it will, there will be areas of the country which will be far easier and accessible to certain terrorist groups, perhaps for certain elements of training. But to the sense that it would be the degree that we saw pre-2001, um, I'm not entirely convinced. I think it would take quite a substantial period of time before you could see that kind of seepage back in. It's not to say it wouldn't happen. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing the anniversary of 9-11 and its legacy. With me is Dr. Ali Brahimi, Research Fellow at London School of Economics, Professor Roger Griffin, Professor of Modern History at Oxford Brookes University, Dr. Tobias Feekin, Director of the National Security and Resilience Department of the Royal United Services Institute. And James Reinald, he's a Middle East and East Africa correspondent based in Nairobi. Obviously, the focal point here is Afghanistan. I'll turn to uh, James Reinald in Nairobi. General Carter Ham, who's the head of the U.S. military operations in Africa, said that Boko Haram in Nigeria, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, close to where you are, and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, were sharing resources and training fighters together. Do you believe him? And do you, does this mean that um, Africa is the new fight and the new front? That, that's certainly been the shift of focus we've seen, I suppose, over the last 18 months or so. The comments that you refer to from General Carter Ham, that these groups uh, that are based in Africa are the new front on the war on terror, the ones that have been cited, have been Boko Haram in Nigeria, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, and also the Al-Shabaab group in Somalia. And of course, there's been a degree of recent activity in Mali as well, where Islam has taken control over parts of the country. So that's obviously on the agenda too. I don't have access to the same kind of intelligence information that Carter Ham does. So the extent to which these groups have been sharing intelligence is, um, uh, is up in the air. I've heard different analysts give different perspectives on it. Um, what I would say is that to think, I mean, what, what has happened over the past a uh, few years in September, has been the uh, gradual erosion of the strength of what is being referred to as core al-Qaeda, you know, the Osama bin Laden-run organization and their, their central belief. And if we are going to see or analyze what's been happening in Africa over the past few years in the paradigm of al-Qaeda, I think it's probably got to be described as a much more complicated picture because these aren't groups with one unified agenda I mean, what Boko Haram want and what uh, Al-Shabaab want in Somalia are actually very different things. So I think in this company, we've got a very uh, complicated picture of different groups that have got their own predominantly national agendas. I mean, what is happening in Nigeria with Boko Haram is a a group that wants to uh, introduce Sharia law across the country, which is split between a predominantly Muslim North and a Christian South. So this and means, James, that they don't have any kind of national aspirations, and I suppose al-Qaeda is the, is the, is the quintessential non-state actor, isn't it? So what, are we clear what their aspirations are? Is it to introduce a kind of Sharia law, uh, work towards a kind of global caliphate, or, or is, it, is it a bit more fragmented than that? Yeah, well, I suppose in the case of uh, the al Shabaab in Somalia, for example, it's a desire to overthrow the UN-backed transitional federal government 
in Mogadishu and control as much of the country as they possibly can with their own agenda at heart. They are the one organization on the continent which has quite clearly um, uh, linked itself to al-Shabaab, um, sorry, it linked itself to al-Qaeda at the beginning of the year. Um, it, equally, they are in decline at the moment. I mean, uh, taking place today is the first presidential election that Somalia has seen on Somali soil in a couple of decades. Um, largely the result of African Union forces and Kenyan forces, which are possibly going to battle them down to the port of Kismayo. And, but, you know, that could, that could potentially be the last stand of that organization. So, I mean, is there, is there key motivation um, what's happening to them in their daily situation, or is it the creation of a global caliphate under the agenda and also because of a broader al-Qaeda organization? I think there are different levels of the answer about organization and different things that they want at different levels. Ali Ibrahimi from the LSC. What are the conditions that allow uh, al-Qaeda, if it's more of an idea than an organization, to, th to flourish in Africa? What you are seeing are these previously localized conflicts that are inspired, I'm sure, and underpinned by localized grievances, developing a more global or at least regional consciousness. And I think Carter Ham is exactly spot on because over the last year, we see mainly a discursive shift in all of these groups. And I'm sure they have their own reasons, resource-based reasons for actually affecting this shift, but it's happening. And a lot of that will actually translate, I'm sure, into coordinated training, the opportunity that's opened up in Mali in terms of Islamist-aligned groups taking vast swathes of territory is very much going to enable that. And I think that Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, the North African franchise of Al-Qaeda, is probably going to be at the helm of this kind of increased attempt to join forces for these localized African groups to punch above their weight and to present a, a concrete threat to the southern flank of Europe. Now, at the same time, what you have in Yemen is Al-Qaeda in Yemen, which are very much the creatures of Osama bin Laden, in the sense that they've learned from the mistakes of the jihad. They see the utter mistake of, of having gone down the route of anathematizing the Shia, slaughtering Muslim civilians. And they've really learned the lessons of the last 10 years and of particularly what's happened in Iraq. And so their solution is we have to start hitting the West again. We have to be controlled, disciplined, strategic actors and focus on hitting our main enemy. Now they, Al-Qaeda, in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen are also seeking to reach out to Africa. But the main question for Al-Qaeda is whether the critical current within its leadership can survive and whether Al-Qaeda in Yemen can be directing things more towards the West or whether these affiliate groups in, in Africa will end up just undermining this attempt to reorient the jihad back towards the West. Tobias, speaking specifically in Africa, given the Afghanistan experience, what can the West do? Can it, can, where can it contribute its resources to a, to a pan-African force that has Western backing? I mean, I think in terms of what's going on in, in, in North and, and parts of, you know, increasingly uh, moving south from North Africa um, and what's going on with AQAP in Yemen, I think firstly, anyone looking at a situation has to remember that borders aren't defined in the same kind of way that we would expect, to, you know, within Europe. You know, the very poorest borders, people are moving a lot, there's a, a lot of shifting economies which don't stand still in one particular region. So it's almost a case, and excuse the phrase, it's, you know, have skills will travel, and people, people who have been involved with these groups will travel between different areas, looking for different ways of influencing or making money. I mean, let's, let's not forget, actually, the groups like AQIM have suffered financially, you know, enormously during the late part of the 2000s because of their lack of popular support and actually what you're beginning to see now are the fact that they're being more and more involved in elements of serious organized crime kidnappings extortions um, assisting the the trafficking of cocaine which is coming in from latin america you know these these are entrepreneurial individuals as much as you know ideologues so it becomes an incredibly difficult situation to control i would suggest actually one of the most effective ways is tackling terrorism through development because a lot of the the ground that's being gained currently i think in that part of the world is through this economic traction with local populations who don't have very manageable ways of making money and, and actually a lot of these groups are providing them with a if you like a, a, a substitute economy which they can plug into therefore they're more willing to take up the ideology as well because it provides them with some kind of basis to provide for their families which is hugely important and also if you begin linking that to some of the messages that you're seeing from al-Qaeda I would say actually rather than um, AQ regrouping to attack the West again what they're trying to do is regroup within themselves and regain that popular support that they might have had at the beginning of the 2000s and a lot of the messages you're seeing from al-Zawahiri are more around popular support for uprisings in Syria and also what AQAP are currently doing in Yemen 
is very much along the grounds of trying to support local populations, provide them with food, provide them with, uh, you know, certain amounts of money to be able to regain that popular support. Because I don't think Al Qaeda, I don't think they're that daft to realise that they're not in a very good position right now. They've been hammered by the West militarily and ideologically recently, and I think they're going through this restructuring and regrouping. Um, Roger Griffin, Tobias raised the issue of of Syria, and El Zawahiri ordered jihadists to go to Syria last February. Do you think Al Qaeda will thrive in this civil war atmosphere, and that could pose a threat for neighbouring countries? Well, it's very clear that whenever you have a breakdown of law and order in a Muslim state, there will be Islamist elements who want to take advantage of that anarchy or chaos and radicalize it because can I just add something to the discussion about global and local I mean there was a f- slogan in uh, that the Greens came with out with a f- 10 years ago or so about act locally think globally one of the extraordinary legacies of the late 20th century was Al-Qaeda's success and to this extent I think Bin Laden and his immediate associates do have a major victory. They managed to convince Muslims fighting Russians that they were part of a global conflict. You get, for example, in Chechnya, where Muslims were were traditionally fighting Russians, you get a very interesting development in the 90s where traditional Chechen Muslims and Islam in Chechnya was very special and local dialect of Islam, started to see themselves as fighting for a global caliphate. And so you get the Islamization of a local dialect of of Islam. And what's happening is that wherever there is a local conflict, a local breakdown, whether it's in Africa or the Horn of Africa or in, say, parts of Pakistan, it's an incredible effervescent mess of religious and economic and political factors, but there will be elements who are now absolutely convinced that they are holy warriors, that they are fighting for, locally, for a, a, a global victory. And it's not just against the West. It's almost simplistic to reduce it to the idea of a war against the West. It is, a, it is in their mind, and I'm talking about the most most extreme warriors. It is a fight for the hegemony of Islam to save a world that has fallen into jahiliya, into into a state of apostasy and decadence. And so it gives these people in the most local extreme conditions a wonderful sense of ultimate goal. And that goal is difficult for counter-terrorist agencies to to break down. It is an extraordinary source of power and fanaticism. I think the most basic pillar of al-Qaeda's ideology in the global sense is that we're fighting a global war in defense of Muslims worldwide. It's the self-defense mechanism that I think is the most important linchpin of the ideology. What the ultimate aim is, the caliphate or or some sort of abstract ideal, is not really the the core of of the radicalizing effect of al-Qaeda's ideology. So I think that's really important in terms of devising our solutions to this because what we've done over the last 10 years is is in many ways reinforce that narrative by launching by launching the policies that we we have and I think that you mentioned before that it was a mindset and I think that more than anything it's a narrative and that narrative can be reinforced but isn't but isn't uh, if Chechens uh, say for instance al qaeda dispatched chechen terrorists to spain this year if you if you've got some um, some kind of fraternity among chechens among tuaregs among um sunni muslims i mean they, 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 it has to be towards a global caliphate can't it because it can't be towards some kind of supranational state i think most people actually know i i would fundamentally disagree with that i think that a lot of people these people feel besieged by the status quo and by the established order. They feel that it victimizes them. And I think that that is more fundamental than fighting for the caliphate, in my view. And I think that that's why you have, you know, people that are radicalized in the West and the causes that they touch upon are Iraq, their Palestine, their Afghanistan. And it's very, you know, very rarely, it's more on the margins when they're talking about, you know, how the world was constituted many centuries ago. What about, about the what about, what, a, what about the ideology of the Arab Spring, this this um, democratization of, the, of, of, say, the Middle East, for instance? How is that impacting on Al-Qaeda's ideology? Is it overtaking Al-Qaeda's ideology and is it impacting them adversely? It dealt a fundamental body blow because more than anything, it's not just that it was a predominantly secular pro-democracy discourse, which was very important, which is what the majority have actually subscribed to all along. They've just been more silent. It was the fact that these jihadis were saying the only way to change the status quo and the only way to dislodge these tyrants is through jihad. And it happened actually peacefully. So that for them was a massive setback. And they knew it. They understood it all over forums and and in, in many tracks that they've released. There is that recognition. But on the other hand, 
for the more fringe element of Al-Qaeda, for its more fringe ambitions, they're saying this is a great opportunity to capitalize on any chaos that ensues and to gain footholds in power vacuums. So it's been double-edged for them because in, within one year, they have made advances all over the region, whereas they shouldn't have because, as Tobias was saying, they are uh, in strategic crisis. And a year ago, they were almost in strategic defeat because they had alienated their core constituency, which was Muslim civilians, predominantly because they were targeting them. So I think that actually the last year has been quite hopeful for al-Qaeda. Uh, and the Arab Spring ideologically dealt a massive blow. But the, the shifting sands of the region are actually presenting an enormous opportunity. Uh, Tobias, and, uh, in some ways, uh, the Arab Spring was a boon for the war on terror, so-called, but in other ways disadvantaged it and, and didn't help it at all. You know, the, the, the Arab Spring in the end was exactly the way you would like to see democracy upheld, which is by the people. Basically, it caught not only Western governments off guard, it caught Al-Qaeda off guard. So, OK, everyone was caught off guard, and it's more about how you respond to that, which is going to be the most important part. Now, from everything that I'm seeing, it would appear that Al-Qaeda are actually playing the waiting game. And, and again, let's, you know, don't forget the kind of long-term ideology of Al-Qaeda is a very patient one, and it's not thinking in kind of, you know, the next five-year time horizon. It's looking at a couple of hundred years into the future. So, if you like, within their ideology, they can afford to take more time to respond and think and, and how they're going to take advantage of this. You know, on the other side of that, Western democracies feel the need to act far quicker, I would suggest, um, again, because there's a different kind of political framework that they're, they're operating with. Uh, many might argue against me on that fact, but I, you know, there's more pressure upon Western democracies, I think, to be to be responding and be seen to be doing positive engagements with these countries than really the onus just isn't on Al Qaeda at the moment. But they're there waiting, waiting to take any kind of opportunity that's that's given. James Reynolds in Nairobi, you reported on the death of Bin Laden. Um, did, his death doesn't seem to have slowed the momentum of Al Qaeda and its ideology, has it? I think the the core group and the the, the, the group that was organized by Osam bin Laden had been on decline because he'd been, you know, had to be holed up in Abbottabad in Pakistan for all that time before the Navy SEALs came in and killed him. Um, I think that the, there has been a decline of the group over the past few years, and I think we're probably getting to the time now where the biggest security threat that we're facing is possibly not going to be seen as terrorism, but there might be uh, you know, other threats like cyber espionage from China, for example, which is going to you know, preoccupy MI6 and other intelligence services around the world. I think maybe if you look at the scale of the terrorism threat, there really hasn't been anything of the scale of you know, the 9-11 attacks. There hasn't been any attack in the UK since the 2005 bombing. And I mean, maybe my colleagues over there can add to this, but we're, we've, we've got to the end of the Olympics and British security services have spent many years concentrated purely on uh, the, the Olympics passing off successfully without any attack, despite the fact that there are probably a bunch, some jihadists in different parts of the world that would have liked to, and they were clearly not able to. Um, I believe the effectiveness of the um, uh, monitoring of digital communications, certain telefe telecommunications, by the intelligence networks of the West has relatively been successful. And, of course, the drone attacks on uh, leaders of these uh, terrorist groups in Somalia and in Yemen and in Afghanistan and Pakistan has largely decimated the organization. So I think we're possibly entering a world where um, this isn't the chief preoccupation of the media. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing 9-11, its anniversary and its legacy. Discussing this is Dr. Ali Brahimi, Roger Griffin, Tobias Fekin and James Reinel. Roger Griffin, can we take the 11 years of there not being an attack on American soil as, as a kind of a resounding success in, in the so-called war on terror? Well, I'm very conscious of the fact. While I was finishing my book, The Breivik Attack, took place and he rewrote the end of my book. And I think that in a way... Uh, we could be now having a very different conversation if something had happened. One of the great legacies of 9-11, since that is one of the premises of the program to investigate that, is the fact that that one attack did change the perception of millions of people living in the West of the world process and created this, this dichotomous mindset where you have Islam versus the West, which obviously is a travesty. And so I would say that, in a way, the way we frame the debate is so dictated by what's actually happening to the West because terrible things can be happening in Pakistan or Africa, but it's not shifting the way the media changes things. It needs one 
and one more Madrid, one more Bali, and we might then be talking about this whole issue in a different way. But the long-term legacy for me, and that in that sense, 9-11 was successful, was to put Islam on the map of Western consciousness in a way which has relatively permanently affected the way the world process is perceived by the West. Ali Ibrahimi, the legacy of 9-11 is t difficult to assess right now, isn't it? It's something that we would have to look at maybe in 20, 30 years' time. Yeah, I think we definitely need the historical perspective. I think we always at will with issues like this. It depends who your referent objects are when you're looking at the success or otherwise of our policies. Because Al-Qaeda is about ideolo or ideology, it is about ideas, but this is a group of people loosely affiliated who have wreaked havoc mainly in the region, in the Middle East and in, in um, uh, South Asia. And I think that what has been a relative success for us is the fact that Al-Qaeda has concentrated its forces. Many of the affiliate groups have been focused upon their localized agendas, which came to a spectacular head in Iraq, where there were these daily massacres of people that they deemed insufficiently Muslim. But that has been replicated throughout the region, where you have this kind of extremely fanatical puritanical ideology that has led to bloodshed knee deep across the region and it has been catastrophic for local populations which has actually led to the near strategic defeat of al-qaeda because it lost the the host population that was su supposed to incubate it but i think that you know al-qaeda has regrouped in many ways and it's on the rise throughout the region and while we might still feel safer we have to be alert to the fact that they are taking territory right now as we are speaking and imposing a horrific quality of life on local populations on multiple fronts throughout the region and that's something that we cannot ignore not only for humanitarian reasons of global obligation and citizenship but because this will inevitably one day present a security challenge to us. Tobias Fekin, I, what was interesting this week in the headlines in the American papers is with the 9-11 anniversary that they've got guards surrounding the site uh, of Ground Zero making sure that people are showing enough respect and um, there is criticism that people have in America have forgotten about 9-11 in the sense that it doesn't unify them in the way that it did a few years ago. Maybe in 10 years time, how do you think the US and the world will view 9-11? I don't think it's the kind of event and kind of period of time that will be forgotten very easily. I, again, I think I'll come back to the first point that I made that I I think it's one of the first times in history that you've seen world politics so heavily dominated by such a, a small group of individuals. Well, I, I also hope that political memories are a little bit longer than they sometimes are. So I would presume that in 10 years, you know, it'd still be seen as this pivotal event at the turn of the century, which led governments to make some quite extreme decisions on the, on the basis of the actions of a few. I think one of the most important factors of this is the fact that, that more people of Islamic faith have been killed during this period of time by Al-Qaeda than, than, you know, Western individuals. And that's, the vast that, majority. Yeah, the vast majority have been. And, and, you know, that's often forgotten. In 10 years' time, we will go through an assessment of, of what this decade gave us and, and are we relatively safer now than we ever... It really, we are safer now than at any point in our human history. Yet we seem to see risks around every corner. We need to grapple with that fact and, and begin to balance our, our responses accordingly. I'd just like to finish by thanking my guests, James Rinal, Middle East and East Africa correspondent based in Nairobi, Dr. Tobias Fekin. He's the Director of National Security and Resilience Department of the Royal United Services Institute. Dr. Ali Abrahimi, Research Fellow at the London School of Economics, and Professor Roger Griffin. He's a Professor of Modern History at Oxford Brookes University, and his book, Terrorists' Creed, is coming out next month. Thanks very much for joining me on The Voice of Russia. Thank you.